you please be seated. We're glad to see you this morning. I wanted to, uh, yeah, I, somebody said that they may not come to church today if uh, we didn't have some sort of juggling going on in the lobby. If you, were, if you were here last Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. It was a great day last Sunday for our Back to School Sunday. And I wanted to just take a moment to say thank you to everyone who prayed for a great day. We had a great event last Sunday uh, for the evangelist and his team that was here uh, last week, the gospel was presented. We had a number of folks that made decisions for Christ. Amen. Uh, and uh, you know what? Not only not only were souls saved last Sunday, but seeds were sown as well. And we rejoice in the fact that you know that that we were able to either plant seeds or water seeds last Sunday. We rejoice because the day will come, and and then the Lord will bring in the harvest for those souls. Uh, that will that are yet to be saved, and so we just thank the Lord for that, for your generosity. I know that uh, with all of the gift cards, because uh, this is the kind of a day, as you know, that uh, a lot of lost people would not find themselves going into a church um, for any other reason except, hey, they have something to help me with, and we want it to be a blessing, uh, as well as as giving out the gospel and showing them in a practical way the love of Christ. And that's what we did last Sunday, and so we just thank God. Uh, for your generosity. We, we had uh, room for more, uh, and uh, I wanted to let you know this week at our staff meeting, we had, I don't know, five or $600, Tom, that were left over from gift cards, so we discussed as a staff uh, what we're going to be doing is we found a local public school, and so we're going to take the, 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 what we had left over, and we're going to put together teacher baskets uh, for a local school and uh, going over there uh, and just being a blessing to them, letting them know uh, that New Horizons is here to help them in any way, share prayer requests as well. And uh, so this still allows us to have the opportunity uh, to open the door for more ministry opportunities. So we just thank the Lord that we're able to do that. Thank you for your generosity. And so we do rejoice uh, in what God has done. And uh, we look forward to uh, next year's event. Amen. Uh, and uh, back to school. And so, you know, even today, it's a good crowd this morning, despite us being towards the end of summer. Uh, and everybody's getting ready to go back to school, and, and uh, I'm sure we're all excited about that. Well, your Bibles are now open to Ephesians chapter number 6. Uh, we are at the second or the last part of the second section of the book of Ephesians. You recall that there are three sections to Ephesians. We talked about from the very beginning, I think it was a couple of years ago, we started Ephesians. Uh, and uh, the first section, of course, was about our wealth, and then our walk, and then our warfare. Chapters 1 through 3 talk about our wealth, who we are, and what we have in Christ. And chapter 4 begins the second section, uh, going into uh, this passage this morning, uh, in light of who we are uh, and what we have, how we are to live. And Paul's talking about our walk. And then the third section, of course, is warfare. Uh, and just a, a, in two weeks from today, we're going to begin the last section of Ephesians. We talked about spiritual warfare because of who we are and what we have, we need to know who our enemy is and how we are to fight this battle, spiritual warfare. And we look forward to getting into that uh, in just a couple of weeks. So Paul, in the very last part of section two, talks about relationships. He has focused on the relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, and now today between uh, employees and employers. And, of course, the mutual submission that Paul reveals in verse 21 of chapter 5, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So you recall that in every human relationship that there is a mutual submission, that we are to understand the role that we are to play is to do so in submission to one another as unto Christ. Not one person is better than the other. Husbands are not better than the wives. Parents are not better than the children. Employers are not better than the employees. Each person has a role, and both are to mutually submit themselves to one another in the fear of God. So as Paul lays out in the very last section here of this, of this passage before us, employees and employers, as we can apply it to us today, uh, Paul is saying that, that employees, you are to serve your masters, you are to serve your employers as if you are serving the Lord himself. Employers, you are to treat your employees in the very same way, the right way, because you have a heavenly master whom you are serving as well. And so we find in our passage this morning about this idea uh, of work relations and how 
employees and employers can work together for the glory of God and for the cause of Christ. So let's pray together this morning as we get into the Word of God. Father, thank you so much for the joy uh, of being together. Uh, Lord, just as we sing, there is joy in the house of the Lord. Lord, help us to sing your praise, to shout your praise. And I pray this morning, Father, that you would so uh, speak to our hearts Draw us closer to yourself, I pray, as a result of our time together in your word, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, And, uh, you know, this morning, it's interesting because when we're talking about employees and employers, let me just ask by quick poll, how many of you are one or the other? You're an employee or an employer? Pretty much everybody in the room uh, has someone to whom you are accountable or as an employer for whom you are accountable responsible. And so we know that in today's society, this is, this is where we're at today, because the world has uh, an idea of, of, of greed, don't they? Whether you're an employee or an employer, there's an element of greed that pervades and permeates the workplace. I was talking to Sean Scaff just in the lobby before the service started, and, and uh, not even really telling him what we're talking about, he was sharing about how workers today, not just a specific demographic, but, but in general, there is such a laziness. He talked about people who want to work less, but get paid more. Does that sound like a great idea? That, that they, wanna, they don't, they don't want to work more, but they want all the bonuses that come along with their, with their job description. And so we see there's an element of greed on that part. There's an element of greed on the, on the part of, of employers where, where they just want to have more productivity and, and more profits. And for some employers, that's what it's all about for them. Not about uh, you know, providing a good work environment, but it's about profit. So clearly in the passage before us, Paul lays out what is the right attitude that the child of God should maintain. If you are a Christian in this room this morning, or if you're watching online today, that you understand that as a Christian, there is a different mentality, a different mindset about the workplace for which each of us must practice. So this morning, we're going to be looking at three things from verses 5 through 9. If you look, number one in your outline, we see the action that is expected. First of all, the action that is expected. Look at verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Notice that first phrase again. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, we obviously apply it today in the sense of employee uh, relationships with our bosses. But here's the reality. As Paul writes this passage, he's writing this specifically to slaves. In the first century, the, the, the good crux of the church was made up of slaves, bond servants. The Greek word is doulos. These were slaves uh, because upwards to 60 million people in the Roman government, watch this now, 60 million upwards that were slaves. Slaves had no rights. Slaves received no wages. There was really, uh, a slave in in the Roman Empire was someone that could be uh, treated poorly. Uh, They could be traded, they could be sold, they could be even killed. Slaves were considered property. The only difference in a lot of people in, in society between a slave and an animal was that a slave could actually speak words. There were so many Slaves, and Paul is saying to them, This is what you are to do as a slave, as a bondservant, as a servant, be obedient to your masters. Now, I hope that you'll grab that or grasp the significance of what Paul is saying here is because, in light of, of this reality, that this, this was their job, this was their ministry, this was how they were going to influence others for the cause of Christ. So, the attitude or the action that was expected was one of obedience. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. It doesn't matter if you're boss or if you're master, if, you, if they treat you kindly or respectfully, even if they treat you with disdain and disrespect, be subject to your masters. Even if the task that was required of a slave was, 
was beneath them or, or, or unfair or unreasonable. They were only to obey in every way their master. The only exception was for a Christian who was a slave to be asked to do something that was illegal or immoral or blasphemous. That was the only exception. Other than that, they were to obey, to be subject to their employers, even today. You may be working for someone who's just been taking advantage of you. You may be working for someone today, and they're expecting more than what they're paying you. Maybe your boss is giving you jobs to do that are not part of your job description. Maybe he seems to favor or she seems to favor one employee over you and, or over another, and, and you think that's just not fair, that's not right. But again, even, even when you know, hey, I'm working harder than they are, and I deserve you know, that promotion, or I deserve that commendation, I deserve that, that award, I deserve that, whatever it might be, what is a Christian to do? Well, it doesn't matter what I might say publicly or personally, the only thing I can say is, what does the Bible say? Amen? What does the Bible say? It says, obey your boss. Subject, be subject to your masters. Be obedient to your earthly masters as you would your heavenly master. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults that you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now what's interesting about this passage is Paul does not condemn slavery. Jesus never condemned slavery. You say, well, and you don't picture Paul. Paul is not writing to the church and he's saying, you know what, I'm going to speak up against social injustice and, and it's not equal, you know, we want there to be equality because in Christ we're all equal, right? And, and uh, Paul could be saying that, but that's not what Paul says. Paul is not saying, get out your picket signs and, and go out and parade the streets and bombard the government about how they're being, uh, slaves are being mistreated. I'm glad we don't really live in that time today, amen? Certainly there should be equality and justice, but, but the Bible does not come out against these things. As a matter of fact, Jesus, who never addressed slavery or these type of social injustices, there was a freedom that came in Christ. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 8. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So here's what Paul is saying. Rather than stand up against your, 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 your masters or your employers about being unfair and uh, treating you unjustly, you know what Paul says to them? Be the best slave in Rome. Be the best slave at Ephesus. Now why would Paul say that? Because there's power in the gospel. You could do a, a search online and you can discover how Christianity was impactful and it had a lot to do with ending slavery in Rome, Christianity. The reality is, is that when you as a slave, when you as an employee work hard for your employer or as a slave you would work hard for your master, that you're doing it as unto Christ, you could win them to Christ. And when you had that right attitude, that right mindset, you could see the difference in the impact that it would have in society. So the best way to bring about change is through the power of the gospel. May we remember that moving forward. Now the Bible says here clearly, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, notice this now, with fear and trembling. Not a cowarding fear, but one of honor and respect. That you would do, have such a respect for your boss and honor them in such a way that you are doing it as unto Christ. Notice here he says, in singleness of your heart, that is with sincerity. You're not putting on a show. You're not standing up like a, like a, like a Christian martyr at work. You're, you are literally uh, showing the honor and the respect to your boss as you would as to the Lord with sincerity. 
That's what the Bible's talking about. You know, even, even if you do not respect your boss for his own sake, respect your boss for the Lord's sake. Your boss is in a place of authority and power, and you are to honor that position and subject yourself to their authority, sincerity, as unto Christ. So, in short, be the best employee you know to be. Now, the truth that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is applicable here. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honesty, honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. For the sake of your testimony, for the sake of the cause of Christ, that you are the best, the model employee, even if you are treated unfairly and everybody knows it, you become a great example to promote the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. So that is the action that is expected. Notice, secondly, we see the attitude that is explicit. The attitude that is explicit. He says in verse number six, not with eye service. I think we know what eye service is, right? Uh, only, only working uh, when you know the boss is around. Anybody like that? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> or working hard when you know the boss is watching. Paul says you are to have the right mindset, the right work ethic that you're not doing your job only when the boss is around or watching. As a matter of fact, you want to be working hard for your employer even if they're not in the office. You should be working hard for your employer even if you know that he is on vacation because you are working for your employer as you are working for Christ. You should always do your job, do your work to the best of your ability regardless of if anyone is watching or not. So the word here for men pleasers, not with eye service as men pleasers, the Greek word for men pleasers is defined as, the, as courting the favor of men, being agreeable, going around your boss. Well, you're the best boss. You know, here, here's a mug, world's greatest boss, Merry Christmas. You know, going around, oh, that's such a great, well, I guess that's why they pay you the big bucks. You know, there's another term for that, right? They call it brown nosing. Um, and, and so being careful about being a, a men pleaser or, or, or with eye service, that you're doing all of these things at work only to be seen by them. The problem with so many men pleasers is that it's only one-sided. What I mean is, so often an employee will will compliment on the front side and then criticize on the back side. Oh, they'll give you a bouquet to your face, but then they'll stab you in the back. So often, and this is, you know, and by the way, if you are a Christian in your workplace and, and you might be one of few, you realize that your co-workers, your co fellow employees are watching how you work. Your work ethic is a testimony of what Christianity looks like. Did you know this? And they know that if you're complaining about your boss to behind his back and, and yet saying sweet things to his face, then they know what you're really all about, being agreeable. You know, notice here he says in verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. You realize that you are actually working for the Lord, not for your boss. He might be writing the paycheck or signing your paycheck, but you don't work for him or her. You work for the Lord. So that's what Paul is saying here is that don't go running around and, and doing things only to be seen and, and to be, you know, eye, uh, eye service and as men pleasers, but doing the will of God from the heart. He says, doing it, doing the service as to the Lord and not to men. Let's compare that with Colossians chapter 3. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, your earthly masters. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, in sincerity of heart, fearing God. 
And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And whatsoever you do, do it with all your heart as to the Lord and not to men. So your job, your job is the stage for authentic Christianity. Understand this. The world does not care what you did on Sunday. It's what you do on Monday that will tell them what you're all about. How you live, how you work, how you, how, how you do the job that's been assigned to you. The world is watching. So your job is a stage to reveal to them Christianity. And it doesn't matter. Well, I just, I'm not getting the job that I think I deserve. It doesn't matter if it's an entry-level job or if you're high up on the corporate ladder. It doesn't matter if you're getting paid minimum wage or, or a nice hefty salary. Every job, every job is a place where Christianity can and should be on display. Every job. That's why, you know, in, in, as a Christian, it doesn't, well, not all Christians are going to be able to, to be in the ministry, to, to be able to, to get paid to work in a church. Not every, not every job affords that opportunity because that's why you go out into the world and, and every job you do, any job you do can be used from the Lord as a mission field to draw people to Jesus Christ. So even though your boss is the one that gives you your assignments and he's, even though he's the one that signs your paycheck, you work for the Lord. Another version puts it this way. It is the will of God that you serve wholeheartedly. It is the will of God that you serve wholeheartedly. Thirdly, we see the affirmation that is expressed. And I hope that if you are here this morning as an employee and you understand, you know what, I'm a little disgruntled, I'm a little disappointed, I'm frustrated, and, or for whatever reason, or if you're an employer, both sides, what would the Lord have me to do? How can I use this situation to bring glory to Him? Notice verse number 8. Here's the affirmation. Knowing, Paul says, that whatsoever good that any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. It doesn't matter if you, if you get paid or not get paid. It doesn't matter if you are a bond slave or, or free. It doesn't matter if, if you're, whatever you do, the Lord is going to reward you. Nothing escapes God's knowledge. Everything that we do in his name will be rewarded. So even if your boss does not give you the accolades that you have earned or deserved, even if your boss overlooks you for those promotions, even though, even though you might have done a, a project and, and you did work very hard in that and, and somebody else took the credit, had the right attitude as unto the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time where new employment might be needed, might become necessary, but when you're on the job, you are to work for your employer as you are working for the Lord. Because indeed, we are. You know, he says, whatever, whatever good anything any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. There's that affirmation that even if you're overlooked, even if you're not getting paid or, or not getting the promotions that you, that you really do deserve, let the Lord handle that. Let the Lord take care of it. I spoke to a pastor not too long ago, and he was a little discouraged, and he has a small church of just several families, and he was a little discouraged that he was ready to, to resign and, and, and to maybe look for another church that had more potential or had more growth or, or whatever uh, he could find. And, and, and so, you know, I said, just, brother, let me, let me encourage you. I said, the blessing comes, and God's not going to bless you because you've got a church of 500 or if you've got a church of 50. God's going to bless you for your obedience and for your faith. I said, it doesn't matter. I said, if God has only entrusted to you three or four families, and this is what God has brought to you, God will bless you for your faithfulness and for your obedience. Stay the course. Do what God would have you to do. 
I reminded him of the passage in Matthew chapter 25. You know the, the parable of the talents where, where the master gave to one servant five talents, to another servant he gave two talents, to another servant he gave one talent. And all he expected from each of his employees was to go out and be productive with what has been entrusted to their care. Now, rather than going into the entire parable, I wanted to show you on the day of reckoning, which for us is the, the day of the judgment seat of Christ, I want you to notice Matthew chapter 25. This is to the man who had doubled the five talents. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of of thy Lord. Did you, did you see that verse right up here on the screen? Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. All right? Great. Wow. Praise the Lord. That guy, did, he earned, you know, he had five, he received five. The guy who had two came up to his master. And he said to his master, I've taken what you've given me and I've doubled these as well. Notice carefully what Jesus says in the next verse. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. He does not say, you have worked just as hard as the other dude. What does he say? You have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. You notice, and by the way, we don't know what reward would be given, but did you notice that what he said to the guy who had five talents is the exact same thing as to the man who only had two talents? So, if you are faithful, if you are in management and you do it to the glory of God, if you're making a great salary and you've got a big team underneath you, praise the Lord, use it for His glory. Or if you're in a job where you're making minimum wage, regardless of the position, and we'll get to it in a little bit, God is no respecter of persons. Wherever you're at, whatever position that you're in, do it to the best of your ability for the glory of God. And if you're faithful and obedient, the Lord will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, the guy who only had one talent, if he would have just simply, even though he could have said, well, it's only one talent, what is that compared to the guy who's even got two or the guy who's got five? Well, he went and buried his in in shame. As a matter of fact, we understand in that past, if he would have simply used what was given to him, even though it was one talent of money, I believe if he would have gone out and doubled that, do you suppose the, Lord, the master would have said the same thing to him? Yes. So be encouraged. At your job, you are working for Jesus Christ. Amen? You are, you, when you go to work tomorrow, you are working for your heavenly master, and you may just happen to be building cars. You may just be happening, you know, as you work for Jesus Christ, you may just be happening to go and work on refrigeration units and trucks. You may just happen to be a school teacher. You may just happen to be a medical professional. Whatever the employment that you do is you work for the Lord, you are are working for the Lord in whatever job that you're at tomorrow. Do it for the glory of the Lord, that you can be a testimony to, to those around you. Notice Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I hope that you will see your mission, your, your job as a mission field, that you would see your job as a place in which you can showcase Jesus Christ by your life, by your light, by your testimony. Let people see Christ in you. Understand that is the role, that is the mission that we have today. And the affirmation that Paul gives, the affirmation that Paul gives is, doesn't matter if they don't give you that promotion or that raise. Now, I'm not saying that we, I'm not, don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm saying the attitude that we should have is not, I'm not getting what I want or what I deserve. But you know what? As a, as a child of God, as a follower of Jesus Christ, that even though they may be overlooking you for those promotions and those raises, you know what? 
I'm going to work my hardest tomorrow. Even though I got turned down for that promotion, even though someone who didn't deserve it got that raise that I deserved, I'm going to go to work tomorrow and work just as hard as if I did get that raise. You know why? Because you're doing it for the master, and he's keeping track. And nothing, nothing you do will go unnoticed. Matter of fact, how much better it will be when you go to work with the right attitude knowing that you are working for your heavenly master. So even if he doesn't give you or she doesn't give you the rewards or the incentives and the promotions or advances, that you will certainly get it from the Lord. I like what the old preacher R.G. Lee used to say, there is a payday someday. There is a payday someday. And then he comes to verse number 9. And masters, of course, to us here today, to employers, those of you who are managers, those of you who are responsible to, to, and you have people working under you, do the same things unto them. Wait, what? If you want your employees to treat you with honor and respect, guess what? Do it to them as well. I know we have a number of folks in our room today who are managers and who are employers, and you, you do work over a, a number of people, but, but treat them with honor and respect. Why? Notice what he says. Forbearing, threatening. What is he talking about here? He's talking about don't, don't give up threatening. Don't, don't use your position or, your, or lord it over your, your people as with authority. Don't forbear threatening. Don't misuse or abuse your power over them. Don't, well, I'm be- you, you better be careful what you say to me because I, I can go ahead and, and I can remove your job or I can make your job harder. Don't, don't abuse your authority. That's what Jesus, or that's what Paul says here to, to these masters or to their employers. Don't throw your weight around. The accountability Paul gives, he says, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Here's why, here's why, masters, you are to treat your servants the way that they're supposed to treat you because you yourself are subject to the heavenly master. You yourself will one day give an account for how you lived your life. And then he reminds them, neither is there respect of persons with him. Well, he's just a slave. So you're, you're, you're master, you're, you're bet no. There's no difference. Paul even acknowledges later on. He says, there is no difference between Jew or Greek, bond or free, for you are all one in Christ. Doesn't matter. Because, could you imagine what the, what the difference, the impact that, that, that the church would have in Ephesus? Knowing that there were slaves and masters that went to church together, and, and they, were, they, were, they were brothers and sisters in Christ. What an impact that would have on society. This is what, what Paul instructs the church to do. For masters to treat them with such care, knowing that you have a heavenly master. And we know that, that there's no difference between Jew or Greek. That was probably the biggest, the biggest concern that the Jews had, that, that as far as being a respecter of persons, that God says, as far as Jews and Gentiles are concerned, doesn't matter. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Whether they were Jew or Greek, doesn't matter. It is the same gospel for everyone. Or what about Romans chapter 2, verse 11? For there is no respect of persons with God. There is no respect of persons with God. So if God sees no difference, Romans chapter 10, for there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. If there's no difference between Jew and Greek from God's perspective, there's no difference between slave or master in God's position, in God's vision. God is no respecter of persons. So whatever position you're in this morning, if you're an employee or an employer, if you're making minimum wage, if you're making uh, salary, um, it, whatever the situation might be, that you would live your life realizing 
that you work for him. You work for the Lord. He is your heavenly master. There is a payday someday. Would you bow your heads with me this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. Certainly this passage applies to all of us. If you are gainfully employed or if you employ others, there's an attitude, there's an expectation, but there's also the affirmation. If you honor the Lord with your life, whatever the job that's been assigned to you, you do it to the best of your ability for the glory of God. If you're here this morning, and I know in just a few moments we're going to stand and have a time of reflection, this time of invitation where, where you can intentionally make a decision. What will I do? I'm convinced. I'm speaking maybe even to even one person that says, you know what? This, there's some stuff going on in my place of employment that I just would just rather quit my job and, and look for someplace else. Maybe, maybe that's what you ought to do. Or you can say, you know what? I'm going to go back with the right attitude. I'm going, to, I'm going to serve, I'm going to honor, I'm going to respect my employer and honor Christ by doing that. And I'm going to work hard. I'm not going to be lazy. I'm not going to go there and, and, uh, and work less but expect to get paid more. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do it as unto Christ. Or if you're here today and you say, I don't, I don't really know the Lord, and, and if the Lord is my heavenly master, I certainly haven't been living like that. I haven't been living as if he's in charge of my life. You've not submitted to him as Lord because maybe you've never received him as your savior. Maybe today is that day. Maybe today's the day where you would say, I don't know for sure that Jesus is in charge of my life. I don't know for sure that if I were to even die today, if I would go to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Don't leave this room without getting that matter settled this morning. Father, I pray now that you would have your will and way in all of our hearts. Every one of us today, Lord, that, that might see this passage in light of how it can be applied to our present situation at work, or that we would examine this passage to know how we can, how we can realize that we are actually working for you. Help us, Lord, to do it for your glory. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. As Renee continues to play this time of invitation, let's settle up with the Lord. to come forward as we receive our tithes and offerings this morning. We do have our last growth class today. Uh, we look forward to you sticking around, grab a cup of coffee or some hot chocolate or something, uh, and we'll look forward to you back here. Don't forget, Tuesday uh, is a special election, and uh, we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. If you're not sure, I think the bulletin even gives you some details about that. This is a very serious, great opportunity uh, to really help to strengthen uh, the uh, uh, the, the heartbeat bill uh, here in Ohio. And of course, as we mentioned, the, really all the whole premise for this, uh, for us is concerned, it's not about money or politics or economy. It's really about life. Uh, and uh, so please stop by. Uh, there's a booklet out on the missions table to give you more information about that. Why, why are we wanting as a Christian, why should we vote yes on issue one on Tuesday? Uh, so please stop by. Uh, and uh, grab one of those little booklets and give you more information uh, about that. We look forward uh, to how uh, God will, will answer. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, just so very thankful for the day, Lord, in your house. Uh, Lord, thankful for the message. 
Uh, Lord, uh, especially thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Father. And uh, Lord, we just uh, ask that you would uh, uh, bless the service to follow, uh, bless the offering now as it's taken up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> came up here I was sent a text from Katie and I'm gonna tell you everything I know about it but she said hey remind everybody secret sister is starting up and if you are interested see Casey in the back I know nothing else that's all I was told so <laughs> if you are interested find Casey she'll be more than happy to tell you when they're starting up uh, we do as pastor was saying it is our last week for our simply thriving this will be the summation of everything we've talked about over the last few weeks. It is our last growth class over the summer, so please stay after. We'd encourage you to, to stay and enjoy our last growth class. This week is also life groups, so if you are interested to get involved with our life groups, I would encourage you to find Pastor Aaron. They'd be more than happy to help you and get you plugged into those areas. We've talked about this over the last few weeks, but the prison ministry, it is coming up very quickly. So on August 18th, that is going to be a Friday, that is the prison ministry training, followed by the next day where you actually get to go and interact and be a part of that ministry. So just if you have written down that you want to go, it is coming up, so 18th and 19th, followed by Sunday, which we are going to have a church potluck. So on the 20th, we are asking for you to bring sides, a dessert. If you would like to bring something, get onto the app, log in, and just let us know. Uh, I mean, it's not the worst thing if everybody just shows up with the dessert. I mean, no one's going to complain. <laughs> but we, <w> <laughs> we would like to have a balanced meal knowing what everybody's bringing so we have a little bit of everything. The church will provide the meat. We're just asking that you bring the sides and desserts. Finally, uh, you'll see on August 26th, we have target shooting activity. As it gets closer, we'll talk a little bit more about what's going to happen. Uh, we're just going to have a good time, go out, and shoot some targets. So let's go ahead and pray, and then afterwards we'll be dismissed for our growth class. God, thank you for the time we have to come and open up your word and, and read your truth. Your word is so complete that it even tells us how we should interact at work. God, I pray that you help us interact correctly with those around us, whether it be a boss, employees, or even customers. God, I pray that you give us grace for those that we find difficult. But God, if we have a broken or strained relationship, I pray you give us the courage to restore that relationship. God, especially in the day we have now, a lot of times we deal with a lot of stress at work and we bring it home. God, I pray that we strengthen our relationship with you, that we don't put those burdens on our family, but rather we help build up our family. In your name, amen. <laughs> 